Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. It's going to be more of a getting to know you type of thing. From my perspective, I'm going to talk about why I was first attracted to Victoria 3 in the first place, um, my general play style for games, which doesn't necessarily apply to Victoria 3, and then we're going to do a question and answer sort of session um, with a whole bunch of Q&As. I think we can get through all of it, and so we're just going to do this all in one take. It's going to be very conversational. Um, if you want to have the game on in the background, or like this sort of thing listening to it as a sort of audio uh, might also make sense because we're not going to be showing anything I don't think too complex um, uh, I don't think there were any questions that were too complex in terms of game mechanics and so showing something uh, specifically on screen might not be so necessary so thing one uh, what uh, in what caused me to really want to play Victoria 3 in the first place uh, and the big one was that it's an economic first focused game um, I kind of came from a background of playing a lot of EU4 and so also it being a paradox game really uh, attracted me and then I stopped playing EU4 for a while following Leviathan which um, left me kind of frustrated with the game uh, but what I used to do in EU4 is I used to just play the Netherlands build really really tall uh, never do anything militarily not really or not be very aggressive and just kind of eco up um, I think my uh, for Civilization 6 the first time I got the achievement for declaring a war was after I had already had several hundred hours in the game and I only fought when someone else declared war on me and I got that achievement while playing with a game uh, or sorry with a friend uh, and so for me uh, it was always been economics first now in Victoria 3, um, it turns out uh, the way to expand economically is to expand militarily, and so kind of an unfortunate situation. Um, the AI doesn't build enough, enough resources uh, for you to really be able to reach your true potential um, unless you expand militarily, and also um, the way infamy kind of feels is it feels like a resource, uh, and if you're not using your infamy decay, you're losing it because your infamy decay is so valuable, and also just going for stuff in the middle of nowhere, like going after Brunei is really 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 lucrative and so it feels bad to not do it and so uh, even though this is kind of something that attracted me to Victoria 3 in the first place um, my very first run I just played as Tunis and I didn't conquer anything and I just sat here and I tried to get a ton of migrants and I just like ecoed up um, and this is kind of my play style with a lot of these games is just to be eco oriented uh, despite this being something that made me attracted to uh, Vicky 3 in the first place um, this is not really how I play now uh, but it was one of the reasons I got Victoria 3 I'm very excited for or, uh, spheres of influence um, I don't know exactly what's going to be in it but uh, I know that something down the road that they are hoping to do is allow you to build um, stuff in your subjects territory and also you know uh, they have these uh, you know British East Africa type things where you these colonial administrations you can release and I'm, I'm excited for maybe more potential of building tall as well as like um, kind of I, I mean I'm also reading a book on industrialization right now and you learn that you know trade uh, and the nature of exploitation was such that you know it really was uh, kind of at least for Great Britain uh, very extractive and they uh, what facilitated industrialization to begin with was their ability to utilize other markets in order to create demand in order to actually make it lucrative uh, to mass produce stuff uh, because most like active production or craftsman type stuff was just for the upper class and you had the subsistence phenomenon and you have to end the subsistence phenomenon in order to get industrialization and this is a bit of digression um, but I do think that uh, you know trade should be more important uh, and also the nature of trade should be such that it is oppressive um, to the people who uh, in terms of their ability to industrialize it should be oppressive to the to the underlings um, or however you want to word like uh, the colonial uh, uh, colonially acquired stuff and so I, I'm really keen on if um, this allows that play style to become more optimal uh, following uh, spheres of influence uh, another thing that really attracted me to Victoria 3 uh, was something that people don't like about Victoria 3 but for me this was a huge selling point uh, which is that uh, the unit there was supposed to be very little to no military micro now I don't think this is kind of borne out and I do feel like I have to micro the military a lot but I'm really a big fan of set it and forget it or like uh, simulating the battles um, this type of thing you know I play total war and then I simulate most of the battles and I just play the grand strategy map uh, for the most part which makes total war games not that much fun um, but uh, this for me was a huge selling point because I'd like to focus on the economics and not really do the warfare stuff that much. Um, to me, it's never been uh, what's most compelling, uh, but instead trying to eco up uh, is what's really interesting to me. Um, and then third, um, the 
I was really attracted to Victoria 3's economic system, which was dynamic, um, because the prices could vary of things. For almost every other strategy game, economy strategy game, the prices don't really vary of the things unless you're just like buying and selling the good, in which case they vary in a way that's not dynamic and uh, interactive with how much you are producing of the good. So for example, like in a trading simulator, they just might randomly trade high in one place and trade low in another place. But here, if it's trading low, it's because you are selling more of it with Victoria 3. And also the value of the building is dynamic. Uh, and in particular, uh, what I found pretty interesting, or at least somewhat recently, uh, you know, kind of in this vein, is coming into the spreadsheet. Uh, avert your eyes from if you're a child. Um, coming to the spreadsheet, uh, I found it like incredibly interesting uh, that uh, you know your. We might want to move this over a little bit, just a little bit. Okay, uh, you know uh, what was, what's optimal price level for different goods? Uh, you know, for wood, for example is going to depend, what the optimum price is for wood is going to depend on, um, you know, what you actually care about. If you care about construction, the optimum price for wood is really low. If you care about, uh, you know, how efficient you are per pot, the optimum price for, for wood is really high. And that you have these equilibriums that are reached uh, as a result of, you know, uh, the equilibriums are adjusted or changed on the basis of like what's going on in the economy and it's dynamic and instead like what you get with most other strategy games is there's the best building to build and you just build a bunch of it and it's like okay and it's not dynamic and it doesn't change over time uh and it doesn't change based on various conditions inside the economy and uh, for me for victoria 3 I, I i was really attracted by that and so that's kind of um like the three biggest things um that attracted me to victoria 3 initially or at least i guess maybe the four biggest things uh which is that uh, uh, one, it was a Paradox game, and I played a ton of EU4, and I really loved EU4. Uh, and then two, uh, it was an economy, or it seemed like an economy first type of game. And for me, this was really interesting. Uh, the market system does seem to be an interesting simulation of the economy. Now, the tracking of all the pops business, I'm less a fan of this, and this is kind of the heart of Victoria 3. And I'm not saying I dislike it, but like for me, this is less important. Um, and I like the idea of no micro. I don't think it's the case that you have no micro. I think that um, wars are kind of micro intensive uh, and you can kind of exploit the AI and do like dirty things to the AI and it's kind of whatever. Um, but then, uh, yep. And then uh, I also really like that the economic system was dynamic. Okay, so on to talking about, um, you know, my style as a player uh, for games in general, but also this applies to Victoria 3. Now, contrary to what people might believe, uh, I actually think of myself as a feel player, which means I will play the game uh, and I will try and decide what's good based on feel, uh, which uh, I, I mean, people might hear that and they go, well, what's this about? What are you doing? You're talking about price equilibriums. What, that's, that's nothing like the sort of feel. Um, I'm also very aware that, um, generally speaking, uh, there's a lot of confirmation bias, and I'm going to probably make a video on why Victoria 3 is so hard to learn, or I've been creating notes for it, but it's kind of a weird video. I'm probably going to publish it on another channel, uh, but uh, I am... I might have a certain feel and something might feel good, but it could be the case that I'm, that I'm mistaken. So generally, kind of what this is all about, this is about confirming or disproving my assumptions about the game. Uh, that's kind of what the spreadsheet comes down to, uh, more so than how I will approach a game initially. And I played quite a bit of the game before making the spreadsheet. And one of the reasons I made the spreadsheet is that I was having a discussion with someone about um, like which good was good to focus on. Uh, and I think uh, we were discussing between tools and clothing, which one was best. And then it turns out the best is just wood. Uh, and uh, based on what I was valuing at the time, which was investment pool uh, type of thing. Uh, and so for me, that the this is always a tool to offset, um, you know, other stuff. But back to talking about confirmation bias, um, Victoria 3 is actually a really hard game to learn because almost all of your feedback for Victoria 3 uh, is long term. And so what is very easy to do in Victoria 3 is to find the laws that you actually just like the sound of IRL and then you put them in and then uh, the line goes up no matter what because it always tends to go up uh, and then you think to yourself, wow, this is great. Uh, the laws I picked are so good. Uh, and so this is both confirmation and placebo. You know, if you enact the laws that you think are good, you're expecting it to look good and then it just happens to look good. But there's a like, there's a, uh, 
there's a, a a giant mesh of a ton of variables that are all applying over long periods of time that affect your GDP line. And so it, it could really not be the, the thing you think it is, uh, but the confirmation bias is going to make you... Um, uh, think that whatever you're doing that you like the sound of is more effective than it is. And I recognize that as a feel player, I'm going to make errors when trying to figure out the game if I don't go out of my way to, to do this. But most of, most of the things that I initially, uh, most of the ph phenomenons that I initially notice in the game, and especially when I'm trying to construct a model of how the game works, um, are on the basis of feel, not um, digging through like the code of the game and like um, starting, my starting point is not the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet is to either confirm or disprove what I think. Um, and occasionally I'll think something's the case and someone says it's like not the case and then I go to the spreadsheet and you know, uh, well, I can't, I can't think of a particular example, but like very much often I'm trying to prove myself wrong uh, because if you're engaging in any sort of inquiry into what's effective and this type of thing, um, you should often try and prove yourself wrong because of the nature of uh, you're going to have confirmation bias. So uh, if I think a liberal government is good, I'm going to overvalue or have a tendency to think parliamentary republic is better than it is if I am operating as a field player. And so it is recognition of this um, type of thing that leads me to do stuff like this uh, so that I can either confirm or disprove uh, my assumptions regarding, you know, what's good. It turns out parliamentary republic is good and being multicultural is good. But being multicultural is really good because of, you know, how migration works. Not necessarily um, because, like, this authority, it's a tr it is a trade-off. Um, but I think that, um, uh, especially when the game was first released, I think that you saw a lot of players, you know, making arguments for stuff that they thought were effective. Also, people sometimes pull out random arguments like that there's a limited money supply which uh I, as far as i can tell that's like not even remotely there's like not even a remote mechanic related to that but that was a thing in vic 2 um and so but the then that they have like these uh economic theories regarding like uh, a mercantilist like uh, interpretation of economics which it seems like this game is very much going against and this is a bit of a tangent but like it's um it's very easy to think you are playing best because the line is always going up and then you, what you're doing, you have a positive response to. But it's not, about the, it's not about the size of the economy, it's about the shape of the line and the more erect the line is, um, the, the better whatever you're doing is, uh, the more effective whatever you're doing is. But you're doing like 20 things at once and they all have really long-term effects. And so this is one of the reasons why it's so hard to learn Vicky 3. Uh, but that it's, I'm a field player, um, I think, uh, is easy to misinterpret. Okay, uh, second of all, uh, I like to focus on relationships uh, in terms of um, when con deciding what to do in games, especially strategy games, I like to focus on the relationships of things. And so early on, um, when I was first playing Victoria 3, I actually focused more on who owned the buildings and ownership more than actually how good PMs were. Uh, and so uh, very early on, I was like, uh, I thought that the ownership of the building was really, really, really important, uh, and I didn't pay much attention to the PMs, and I thought ownership was everything, because I was looking for what relationships were important. Um, and this is still kind of how I approach the games, or games in general, is I'm looking for relationships that are interesting and dynamic and are maybe not so apparent, um, and very often, uh, you know, uh, you will have people that just operate from like a power level perspective, and so, um, and this is... Uh, uh, we might we're gonna look at another example in Magic the Gathering um, kind of well we'll talk about it now um, so I have also played a lot of Magic the Gathering which is a different game uh, and then here let's move this over because I think there's ads off to the left of here uh, but this is a deck that I played a lot of Magic the Gathering which was Eternal Command uh, which was a deck that had a bunch of really low power level cards um, like these 2-1 is a really small body if you've ever played a card game it sounds really small uh, but the whole idea is you would try and recur a bunch of uh, use these guys to effectively be spells um, because they would bring back spells from your graveyard uh, and this sort of thing and um, it was all about this dynamic relationship of being able to use your graveyard as spells and having these small little creatures uh, that could kind of get through for chip damage but overall if you take a look at this deck the power level of each individual card is incredibly low and instead what you're getting is a combination of tempo or speed 
and also the relationship of these cards being very strong. So for example, Eternal Witness can bring back any card, uh, and then uh, Cryptic Command uh, can bounce a, a creature. Eternal Witness, you get back a card when it enters the battlefield. So every time it enters the battlefield, uh, you'll get back a card. Cryptic Command uh, will allow you to bounce the creature. Uh, so you could actually bounce Eternal Witness uh, and then return it to your hand, replay it, get back Cryptic Command. But Cryptic Command lets you choose two modes. Uh, and the other one you could sometimes use is tap all creatures your opponents control. If they're tapped, they cannot attack you. So you can actually set up a loop in this uh, with this uh, deck that makes it so your opponents cannot attack you at all, ever. Uh, which is a very... It's not necessarily a high-powered thing. You know, Eternal Witness is a 2-1 creature. It's very small. Cryptic Command is uh, this tapping your creatures of your opponents for one turn is really not that strong an effect. But together, if they produce this sort of lock. And then there's this card uh, called Aether Vial, which allows you to kind of play your creatures for free. Uh, because the amount of mana required to play both of these cards in one turn is really high. And this effectively decreases the mana. And so it is the relationship of these three cards uh, that kind of got the namesake of the deck eternal command but when i play victoria 3 i'm also concerned with relationships uh and so uh, i i'm looking more for the relationships of t multiple mechanics and so um you know how how even like um uh reducing the number of laborers for example will raise the average sol because you are decreasing um you know the number of you're dec you're increasing the overall wage multiplier because labor saving pms um almost universally, there's a few exceptions, uh, will actually only decrease laborers, which have a wage multiplier of one. And so this, you know, if you're just thinking of power level, you're thinking of, okay, what's the input and output of the building? But if you're thinking in relationships, you're thinking, well, okay, what happens when I increase the average, you know, wage multiplier of the people working in my building? And you will have increased SOL, increased literacy, these types of things as a secondary effect. And um, almost everything you do in Victoria 3, and this is one of the reasons I like Victoria 3, you know, post being attracted to it. Um, almost everything you do in Victoria 3 is going to have secondary effects. And so n there's, a dun there's a bunch of different relationships and everything's kind of interconnected in a very harmonious way. And so um, being relationally focused, uh, you get this... Uh, the How's the, how's the way? There was a, a chess player, a world champion named Vasily Smyslov, um, and he had a nickname. And the nickname was the hand, uh, because he would he the hand the claw would reach down he'd touch a piece he'd grab a piece and then he'd make the perfect move, and his philosophy on chess uh, was that it was uh, like a symphony where everything just it was all about harmony and everything had to go in the right place and do the right thing and then also everything related in a perfect way in Victoria three it's. Uh, it's a very harmonious game because everything you do is going to affect a bunch of other things, but no effect is like left unaccounted for. And so like if we increase the price of iron, this is going to have secondary effects uh, and a whole ton of secondary effects. Um, increasing the price of iron might not be, you know, the best example, but um, there was a discussion I was having recently with someone regarding, um, you know, how good is deficit spending? And I think it's really good when you're a GP. But one of the hard things about it is that the effect, the thing that makes deficit spending good is not that you get to spend a whole bunch of money that you uh, otherwise could have waited a little while longer and gotten to spend uh, uh, later. Um, the reason deficit spending is so good is because it stimulates your economy. You add a whole bunch of buy orders to your economy in terms of your construction goods, right? Um, and what you get when you add a whole bunch of this to the economy is you get uh, uh, every single one of these buildings is way more profitable. And very importantly, the margin of balance plus wages is extremely important. Uh, and so it's not just about making this number a little bit bigger in terms of the profit, but the margin when you're doing weekly balance plus wages, this is how much value is added to the economy. And so a slightly higher iron price uh, uh, will lead to a much bigger, um, you know, overall increase in price um, than otherwise it would be expected. And so the, the real benefit's not the faster construction. It's the stimulus is the benefit of uh, deficit spending. Um, but we, we have this thing where, you know, when you're thinking of a power level orientation, um, your calculus will be like, how many buildings do I get and how much faster do I get these buildings? But instead, if you're looking for deeper relationships with the game, you get this thing where you're like, well, you know, 
it's going to increase the price of everything, my guy. Uh, and this is the only way to overall increase all prices a little bit more, is to spend from the government. Um, well, it's not the only way, but it, it's the most straightforward. Technically, minting, for example, uh, is always injecting free money into the economy. So when you spend minting money, it lets you have a better balance while still injecting more. And so you would, have le you would not necessarily run a negative balance. But running a negative balance... It allows you to produce, uh, you know, positive effects in your economy that are not necessarily easy to discern. And it's going to have cascading effects because, um, you know, uh, okay, we increase the price of steel when we do that, which increases the weekly balance, which increases the, you know, uh, in increases the reinvestment, which is positively modified by, um, you know, the, the industrialists, uh, and which, well, when they're happy, these ones aren't happy. Um, and this positive modification is a free money modifier that allows the prices to be even higher and this sort of thing. And it's just like, um, it's an effect that's like really hard to mathematically model. I don't know how you do it because if this balance is lower and the wages are lower, you know, if you increase the inputs and the outputs by 20%, this is uh, a net positive for the economy. When you increase the inputs and the, or decrease the inputs and outputs by 20%, this is a net loss for the economy because for the most part, uh, every PM uh, is, is lucrative. Uh, it, it has a positive balance. So um, when you, here, coming back, let's maybe take a look at the spreadsheet uh, for kind of explaining this. Um, you know, if we come into the chop chops and look at simple forestry, right? Uh, if we increase uh, the inputs, if we increase the outputs uh, by, you know, uh, 50%, the output will be 1800. If we increase the inputs by 50%, the inputs will be 300. Uh, and this will actually make the margin way bigger, the net value added, uh, which is going to go either in terms of dividends or in terms of wages. Uh, and so if we go, you know, this up to up 50% is 1800 minus 300, that's going to be 1500. That's 50% larger on the net value added um you know uh is that right is that 50 percent more 1800 minus 300 okay but in any case i i guess it's just 50 percent straight across i guess that also makes sense um but this is like uh this is a pretty big deal if you can like increase prices by like 20 percent uh across your economy entirely uh because it allows you to you know increase the value added by 20% uh, alongside it, um, which is obviously good. Um, of course, there's it's complicated because there's more to unpack with that, and we're not going to do it because it's not directly a 20% increase. But I wanted to say that, you know, uh, I'm generally relationship focused. And, you know, maybe coming back into here, let's move this to the side again. Uh, coming back into this, uh, this deck was bad. Uh, coming in the Magic the Gathering example. Uh, Yasuoko's Eternal Command, uh, it was really, really good for one tournament in 2012, and then it was bad. I played it for like a decade, uh, even though it was bad, because another part of my play style is I generally hate doing meta. Uh, and I know this sounds weird, um, Victoria 3 is like this weird thing, because I think to some degree I'm uh, involved in the construction of the meta, and so... Um, I think I play meta for Victoria 3, but generally speaking, uh, stylistically, I try and go as off meta as possible and try and find, you know, uh, things that have uh, interesting relationships uh, and uh, try and make something that is conventionally thought of as not really working, um, trying to make it work. Um, but this deck overall was not strong after the printing of a card called Deathrite Shaman, um, and no one really played this deck uh, again after the tournament, and you saw it almost nowhere. And um, I made a ton of pet brews around this deck, which is kind of the third thing, uh, or the fourth thing, uh, I really like discovering and innovating as much as possible when playing a game, uh, and so for me, the the there's in Magic the Gathering, there's something called net decking, where you just, you know, find a website that has the best deck with the highest win rate, and you just play that, the Legends back, how about not, um, and so you just play the the thing with the highest win rate and for me i i was not a fan of this i always liked you know coming up with my own thing um and innovating and doing this sort of thing and um this involved me playing a lot of things that were not very good uh when it came to decision making in terms of deck building uh in regards to the the, the tcgs uh and so uh this uh i think i still get a lot out of this in victoria 3 
uh, in terms of discovery and innovation, particularly when a new patch drops. Um, when 1.5 point oh dropped and local prices were introduced this for me was like such a renaissance in terms of enjoying the game uh because uh you know i was starting to feel burnt out but then there's this new system to discover and try and figure out what's optimal and for me figuring out what's optimal is what's really fun about stuff uh, and that's what's fun about victoria 3 if victoria 3 was less complex and was easier to solve it wouldn't be as engaging to me. Uh, and also, the fact that you, there are so many different relationships, occasionally you get yourself in contexts that you haven't been before, and you notice a novel type of idea regarding like relationships of stuff, like for example, in this Transvaal run, uh, really have to deal with discrimination a whole lot uh, throughout the run, and um, it was a cause of you know needing to do novel and interesting things. Um, there's a few things we didn't abuse. Um, uh, I actually think that... Uh, my my runs are not uh, entirely 100% pushed, uh, despite um, kind of a focus on proper play. Um, there's this notion in chess about like um, uh, being an error, uh, and I, I try and play error free. Uh, in a sense, or try and play correct uh, when I'm playing a game, but at the same time, um, there are certain things, there's a lot of things that, uh, mechanics that I don't abuse uh, too much, like you can infamy reset, um, I try not to do this, um, uh, which is, uh, if you have a civil war, you switch sides to the, the revolution, and you play the revolution, and you clap the winner, or you clap the original one, it'll reset your infamy, for example. Um, I don't do 100% all of the mechanics that are, like, most pushed. Um, but um, the main thing is uh, is figuring stuff out. And so I actually get a lot of enjoyment from doing stuff like the spreadsheet, not because uh, I this is the type of player I am, but because with the spreadsheet, um, it, it, it allows you to kind of discover things. And so... Um, things that are maybe not necessarily apparent like this uh we redid the spreadsheet to look at efficiency per 100 workers which for me was a bit of a paradigm shift um and i think that early on i focused too much on um uh how much how efficient stuff would be per construction in terms of adding to the investment pool uh, which is what this column was about. And when I initially made the spreadsheet for the first time, this is what I was most focused on. Um, to some extent, I also think this is less important in current iterations of Victoria 3 uh, because uh, the MAPI, uh, local prices, um, just absolutely crushes profits uh, in a large extent because what it does is it, uh, it, in it increases the price of the inputs by like 10% uh, and decreases the price of the outputs by like 10%, which is absolutely bone crushing to the overall balance. And um, investment pool is much stronger when your balances are much, much bigger. Uh, and so uh, investment pool as a mechanic in 1.5 significantly nerfed. Um, but uh, I, I've also become less focused on that um, as, as time has gone by. Um, okay, uh, and so I think now uh, we will take a look at some of the Q&A questions. Okay, there wasn't a single one that I thought was just inappropriate to answer this type of thing. And so uh, I'm just gonna go through them one at a time. I might be pausing a few times as I go through in order to pull up information, um, but um, we'll, we'll just start with the top. Uh, what aspects of the game are you most looking forward to being improved? Any new features you hope to see in the game? So I've long kind of been of the opinion that the worst thing about the game or the worst thing in the game on release, the worst thing with that was the UI. But following them fixing the UI, uh, the worst thing in the game is uh, diplomatic plays. They are uh, psychotic. Uh, they don't give a sense of agency, and um, they like having to put in. All, there's so many things wrong with the diplomatic play that like it's hard to list them. Uh, and I'm looking forward to spheres of influence because I think the diplomatic play is going to be uh, improved. Um, you know, you have to put in all your war goals at the very start. Um, the ticking war score below 100 or below zero is like a weird like uh, mechanic that seems like somewhat like uh, it does not feel like good at all in my opinion. Um, and the biggest thing about the diplomatic play is you really it's they're compl they're very 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 opaque and they don't represent this diplomatic jockeying because there's very little player agency in what happens and what usually happens or the frustrating thing that happens is a great power just decides they want to stick your, their finger in your pie and so um, I think that. Uh, this has long been kind of the most frustrating um, aspect of the game, um, uh, and I'm looking forward to it getting changed. I think that
that the diplomatic play is the singular reason why, um, you know, or the diplomatic play is just kind of being psychotic, uh, in diplomacy in general kind of being rough, uh, is the reason why the game was released uh, where you could get achievements without Iron Man. Or this is what I felt at the time of release, but it seems like Paradox is moving um, in a more non-Iron Man friendly uh, direction in general, and so maybe this isn't true, but um, I, I think that the diplomatic play is, uh, is an unfun mechanic. Um, I think that the way that wars are in like EU4 is much better. Uh, you can join ongoing wars, you can have multiple wars at once. There's just so much about um, the nature of declaring wars and being in wars in uh, Victoria 3 that uh, leaves a lot to be desired. However, I'm not, the warfare system is not what's most important to me, uh, and it's never been, and this is not what I look for in a game, so I don't care too terribly much, but I do think that this can be the most improved. I have a friend who only cares about warfare in games, um, and uh, I, I've told him he probably shouldn't play Victoria 3, uh, because if, if you're, well, not only, you don't get to micro your armies a bunch, uh, in the sense of, like, a normal micro in your army, it's about getting your guys to the fronts and moving your guys from the fronts in a weird type of way that is gamey and probably shouldn't be a thing. Uh, but uh, that warfare is so... that this diplomatic play so constrains warfare um, is definitely kind of an unfun type of thing, I think, uh, and I'm keen on it. Maybe getting improved on in Spheres of Influence. I haven't heard any news of Spheres of Influence, although um, it looks like I might get early access to Spheres of Influence. I don't know yet um, what's going on with that um, as of the recording of this video. But um, I think that if this is something that's changed, um, I, I would be really happy about it. I, I and I, I don't have a direct suggestion. I think the idea behind the diplomatic play, that there's some sort of diplomatic jockeying, I think the idea is good. I just think that the execution is uh, not good. And so um, I, I don't necessarily want them to throw out the diplomatic play entirely and just adopt EU4's war de declaration system, but I, I think it should be improved. Um, so let's go on to the next question. Uh, you have a bit of uh, private questions related to the background and YouTuber experience, uh, if it's okay, or I have a bit. Uh, your content delivery skills quite good. Thank you. Uh, you remember everything that you've mentioned already? I do not. Um, in previous videos, despite enormous amounts of information, which there is uh, uh, which there is in game mentioned, and also your knowledge about the mechanics is very deep. Uh, just a note, I often... Uh, a weird thing for me in terms of making videos is I repeat myself, and I repeat myself intentionally, and... I'm uncertain how much I'm supposed to be repeating myself because uh, repetition is also like one method that you learn. Uh, but also like I create, like I have like a note thing that's got like, okay, this twin studies thing is from a different thing, but I do have like, I, I do have a piece of paper with like seven or eight things off to the side about what I want to talk about often when I make a video and I just like glance at it and then I kind of know. Okay. So what's your background? Um, so I was a philosophy major in college, uh, and uh, <laughs> which is kind of the the degree you do if you um, don't want to do anything like, uh, or how should I put it? There's no philosophy factories. There's like no track after that other than teaching. And then I was trying to get into maybe teaching philosophy. And so to some ex uh, extent, pedagogy became an important thing to me, but I also swapped majors a whole ton. I swapped like five different majors and I've always regarded myself as a generalist. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was initially a business major, then I was a marketing major, then I was uh, a psych major, and then I was a philosophy major. I think that was the order um, or the different things. And so I have an enormous interest in all of these things. I read a lot of all these things. Oh, I was an econ major as well for a little bit. Um, and so I, I had five different majors that I swapped. I eventually ended on philosophy, which is Again, uh, kind of um, the off-meta type thing to do. Um, if you want to, you know, be successful, it's not really necessarily the good thing. But I was, I was trying to understand life and like this type of stuff, and to some extent, struggling with depression and this sort of thing, and like, what's the point of it all? Led me to philosophy. So that was my background. Um, uh, Pre-COVID, uh, I was teaching chess uh, to in after-school programs. That was no longer possible when COVID hit, uh, and then. Uh, after that, I, um, during that time, I was also, uh, started a YouTube channel, um, Generalist Ideas, although it was just titled after my name at that point in time, uh, and, uh, that, I, I started uploading book reviews onto that, um, and so, uh, that's kind of where things were, and then, uh, what happened following that is, uh, obviously there was COVID, um, and then I started writing, I wrote a book, uh, I couldn't get it picked up by agents, 
Uh, it was regarding the subject of agency, which if I try and unpack that, this will make this video way too long, so I won't unpack it too much. Um, but the working title was like uh, attention to agency. The overall thesis was that uh, attention is the um, you know, grounds by which uh, you actually have agency in the world, your ability to control your own attention. And um, the, it argued for a system of uh, structured mental introspection or mental exercises in order to um, develop a sense of agency. Um, and so that was kind of the idea. Uh, but then uh, I wasn't being very successful at that. And then I tried to push YouTube a little bit more. I have a decent amount of savings um, uh, such that I can kind of try and do this, but this is like the YouTube is like what I'm trying to do right now. Uh, were you related to mass uh, media industry? No, but uh, in terms of being able to present ideas, um, uh, it might to some extent be with chess with kids. Because with kids, um, you, have to, you have to distill something down to its simplest form. And uh, metaphors go a long way with kids. Uh, and I'm not trying to say that I think of you as children, uh, but it leads to what I think is uh, actually a good uh, style of presenting information. Um, there's um, Steven Pinker wrote a book on style. I forget the name of the book. You could probably do Steven Pinker's style book and f find it. Um, but he, what he argues is for the classic style. Uh, and for me, this was uh, very important and also critical um, rela related or relative to the philosophy. And what this classical style is, is that you are writing in such a way that you are trying to um, make yourself understandable to other people. And success is not them finding you intelligent. Instead, um, success would be them feeling intelligent. Uh, and so you are trying to present the information and then give kind of the argument and let the person see the argument with the information itself. Uh, I think when a lot of people are presenting information, they are trying to uh, make themselves sound as smart as possible. If this is your goal, you use a lot of big words, um, which is what a lot of people in philosophy in general did, uh, like listening to two philosophy people talk to each other. I think that the, the language that they use is incredibly pretentious most of the time because it's often way more complicated than it needs to be for the purposes of making themselves sound intelligent. Um, and so I think operating in this classic style, which to some extent I got from the writing, has been what I've tried to do when making videos, which is that I try and present the information and then say, this is why this is this. Uh, and when you get the information and your brain goes click, then you as the viewer get to feel intelligent, right? Uh, my goal is not to make myself seem intelligent, which is a different goal. And it leads to a different type of communication style. One that uh, is, I mean, I talk fast. I should probably talk slower. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of ways in which uh, people, their primary interest is not communicating in this classic style where you are trying to make your viewer feel intelligent and understand the idea. And instead, they are trying to inflate their own sense of what's going on. Um, and if you ever get this impression that this is what the author or, um, you know, what the what the content creator is doing, because um, when someone's trying to seem intelligent, there's two like kind of perspectives. Um, the one is you or people in general will often just find these people intelligent. Uh, and especially the ones that speak like in such complex language and it's just all sophistry. And then the second thing is you realize that they aren't there's not really as much substance there. Uh, and it's just kind of a front to sound intelligence. And then it just like kind of is sad. Um, you know, because if you're trying to do a tutorial for something, for example, the goal should be people actually understanding it. So, okay. Or perhaps you use, uh, uh, using a particular method of structuring and delivering ideas while not repeating yourself too often. I, I mean, I have some things written off to the side, but I, I like to think I don't repeat myself. I will. I, I do repeat myself and I sometimes intentionally repeat myself and I think that repetition is important for getting the ideas, but um, maybe it also has something to do with the way I emphasize stuff, um, which I think is maybe useful. Um, okay. Or you just re read many books. I have read many books. I've read over 500 books. Um, just in terms of like, I used to have like a Goodreads that I kind of kept up with and it's not that much over 500, but it's definitely over 500 at this point. I read a lot. I used to read a lot more before Victoria three. Uh, actually when I was looking at my Victoria three hours and I passed 1887 hours or 1836 hours, I was thinking to myself, man, I could have read a hundred books, um, in this time or like 150, something like that. Um, which is just like, I think it's crazy that a lot of people like some, 
there's some double digit statistic people when when they're done with their schooling so when they finish high school if that's the last schooling they have or when they finish college if that's the last schooling they have a double digit percentage of people never read another book again which is crazy to me because if you want to if you want to get information at a high velocity reading books is really the good way to do it you can get some information with youtube but i, I think that there's something that uh, I think YouTube is relatively passive and a book is active and also um, there is not the same type of editorial oversight with, uh, you know, information presented on YouTube as there is when it is being published in a book. Uh, and so uh, I, I think if you want to learn about something, you should just read a book about it. Like one thing that happened recently, and we're not gonna, I'm not going to comment in detail on this, at least not on this channel, um, was the Israel-Hamas, you know, conflict uh, that has escalated, right? And I knew I was going to want to talk about this in some context with some people. And so um, rather than just talking about it based off of like little blips of information I've gotten through various media, I read a book on it and it's like, okay, I'm not an expert on it, but there's a big difference between um, consuming information in like, uh, I don't know, like in shorts or in YouTube videos than there is spending, you know, 10 to 15 hours reading a book, which isn't too long. I see that in some languages there are no channels with a good exp uh, uh, with such good explanatory content on Victoria 3 is yours, so I seek your advice uh, for YouTubers who could help fill the gap for other content like, for the languages. I would say that, um, you know, trying to com communicate in the classical style that uh, is espoused by Steven Pinker in his style book uh, would be useful. Okay. With your hectic release schedule here, I'm impressed that you are able to regularly upload a new book review on the Ideas channel. Uh, that's this one, and I, the last one I did was The Medium is the Massage. Um... Uh, any I, advice on how to read books and to take notes on them? What's the book reading meta? Okay, um, well, the book reading meta, um, in my opinion, is a volume approach, uh, which is that um, you shouldn't be too concerned about getting this question right as much as you are just actually reading the books. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, action is more important than, uh, like, trying to optimize, in my opinion. Uh, that said, I do annotate every single book I read, and I annotate through highlighting, which is relatively low investment, and it makes it, if you ever reread the book for the same information, super, super, super effective. Uh, I would advise someone just getting into reading books to try and read easy books, um, because you get a big, like, sense of accomplishment from fi finishing the book, and so undertaking some big, thick book is, like, not a good idea uh, as your first type of thing, um, but uh, I think that brute force just reading a lot of books is a really good way to get uh, a lot of information. Information. There's a few times, uh, and I think I've talked about this on the other channel, on the Ideas channel, um, but uh, there's, there's, I think I've done it three times now where I read a book a day for a month, uh, which is very doable, uh, but it takes over 10 hours uh, a day on average of reading. Uh, and so it is rough, uh, and also it like makes your brain feel like you feel super fried. Uh, the retention is not that good. Uh, but, you know, if you're retaining, let's say you retain 70% normally. Uh, and you read uh, two books a, uh, a month, right? That's 1.4 units of knowledge. Uh, if, you rate, if your retention goes down to 20% and you read 30 books, uh, you know, that's still six, what is that? Six units of knowledge? No, 0.2 times three. Yeah, six units of knowledge. It's still more knowledge. And so like, I, I think that brute force is really good. And also um, it's very interesting when you read a bunch of different books, you see that a lot of things that cover the same topic operate from multiple perspectives and having multiple perspectives I think is useful. And also you start to notice more patterns and relationships um, in that uh, you can relate one type of model of reality or thing that you learned in a book to something you learn in another book or something you encounter like let's say in a video game and it helps out a lot. Um, in terms of video game background, to some extent, uh, you know, like the way I play Victoria 3 is going to be informed by other games I've been interested in. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example, like poker might be a good example of a game that influences my Victoria 3 play, although I don't have a particularly strong example of um, an instance where poker uh, specifically did it, but poker, uh, learning how to play poker at a high level or relatively high level, or learning about some of the theory of poker. I don't want to say I'm a crusher. Um, for me, uh, it provides an interesting sort of way of analyzing other games. I think that um, my problem with poker is mainly psychological, more so than theoretical, which is that it's tough to play poker really well, um, psychologically speaking. So let's jump back in. Um, do you think there's any long-term fix to late game lag? I don't know, other than if they made... Um, 
uh, fewer. They if they some they somehow have to decrease the number of pops, uh, the number of pop entities. My understanding. Um, or here, let's finish the question. Or is there something players will have to deal with forever? Also, do you think Paradox is in a tough spot because, uh, because the game complexity they uh, because it's in a tough spot because the more complexity they add, the more lag the game gets. I think they are in a tough spot, uh, and I don't have a solution. Um, but every time they add an additional thing to for the game to keep track of, it adds more lag. And the primary driver of this. Uh, is the fragmentation of pops, is my understanding, uh, which is that if we look at the workforce, specifically in the coal mines, we can see that there's a bunch of different capitalists, and the game can calculate, but it's having to calculate for coal mines in Sistan, the particular this guy, the one Boer Shiite, Boer, however it's pronounced, the two Sunnis that are there, uh, the, you know, the Somalis that are there, the Luandas that are there, and it has to do this for every building in every state in the game. And those fragmentation is a huge driver of lag. One thing they could do is, like, when someone leaves Europe and immigrates to a different continent, they could just change it to, to a pop-type European migrant. This is a proposal I've seen. I can't remember the name of the person who proposed it on uh, the Discord. Uh, but I actually think this sounds like a good one. And so when they move to Brazil and they move on the basis of their European heritage, uh, they will not be, uh, you know, Russian. They will be European migrants. And so this would reduce the fragmentation. I think fundamentally they have to reduce fragmentation. It seems to some extent they have intentionally slowed down the player a lot. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how much of this is intentional. To be honest, actually, I, I say it, look, it sounds intentional and maybe that's conspiratorial, but local prices slowing down the economy definitely, uh, you know, makes the game perform better for longer because post 1.5, we would have had like 6K construction by now and now we have 1K, right? Um, you know, this slows down. Uh, they made all things cost 33 to 70 percent or 77% more construction. This slows down the player. And being slower is not necessarily a bad thing because everyone slowed down. It's a relativistic thing. And so um, it does mean you can't just like blast super huge GDPs uh, like you could before. So relative to previous patches, it might feel bad. Uh, but slowing down the player's ability to construct and build a whole ton of stuff will improve performance. And they have done this in a number of different ways. Um, and I, I don't know how much it's intentional. They don't seem to be increasing the velocity at which the player can play. Um, they also nerfed overall population growth, which decreases the amount of fragmentation that will occur by just decreasing the number of pops. And so, um, I, but I, I do think it's a long-term problem. Uh, and I, it seems that every single time something gets suggested um the or not every single time but an amount that is uh uncomfortably common for me uh in terms of evaluating how my game is like you know proceeding or the game i play um uh is that when it comes up it comes up um something very significant comes up or, or sorry when a new implementation or a new uh, feature is being proposed one of the responses as to why it can't happen is performance based not because we can't model this, it's difficult to program, but it's it's going to add too many more calculations. And so I also don't care that uh, I know how many Greek people are in Ishfan, or if uh, you know the Greek people get merged with the Dutch people. Like to me, I don't care about this. Uh, and so, um, and like, look at, look at all this. This is in the one state. Look at all this. And to be fair, you can uh, increase uh, the rate at which these people will just you know, get bopped and just get merged with the primary culture, but this is kind of what I'm talking about, and I think that that's what needs to be um, dealt with. Uh, to some extent, the cultural communities mechanic that was present in 1.5.5 might address that. Um, we only got to see it for one singular patch, and then they put it under wraps because it was way not tuned at all. Okay, so let's kind of keep moving on. It's taking me longer to answer these than I thought. What do you hate most about in the game? Uh, we kind of already answered this, uh, the diplomatic plays. Which bug do you wish would be fixed the most? Um, I, something that's very frustrating that comes up a lot uh, is that you cannot ask to join customs union you are eligible to join if you have a subject. Uh, I do wish that that would get fixed. Um, and I, as far as I'm concerned, that is a bug. Um, and it's a very frustrating bug because it's like not one you can very easily play around. Um, there's probably other bugs that are, like, annoying, but you can play around. Like, your, your, your army getting banished to the Shadow Realm, there's ways you can play around them, but you can't play around this, really. Um, okay. 
How much would you like to see philosophical uh, movements implemented more again a ton uh, and their culmination? I think that there should be an underlying, um, you know, cultural mechanic and that one of these mechanics should be, um, you know, entrepreneurship and that you, uh, your ability to be an entrepreneur or your ability to build buildings and use PMs should perhaps be gated by cultural means because historically speaking, uh, people's willingness to invest private money uh, was a huge driver for, uh, you know, the industrial revolution and people adopting the mentality that they should invest money for the purposes of making money, like this sort of thing. Uh, but I also think that, you know, free speech should have a cascading uh, effect. And I think that there should be this um, complex cultural overlay. I don't have a, a, a full uh, description of what that should be. I think that uh, art should be replaced with mass media and the art building should be replaced with another building. Important, we're not adding new buildings because that uh, makes performance worse, um, but that this should be affected by your free speech laws. And I think this would be a really interesting. Okay. This is several questions. Do you think infrastructure projects that are interstate or inter country uh, should be added as decorations, great works, or something similar? I don't care about the visual stuff on the map that much. Uh, transcontinental, trans uh, all these trans railways uh, and um, canals. I think canals should be more substantive, but this is a different thing. Also for the devs, uh, why isn't there a relatively expensive but technically possible option in Nicaragua like there was historically? Um, yeah, I can't answer that one. But um, uh, I, I do like these projects. I think canals should, the canals should get some sort of positive treatment, I think, because they are pretty significant. I also think, yeah, I, I, I think that they should get some sort of thing. Do you like playing releasable nations? If so, which is your favorite? I do like playing releasable nations. I think rele releasable nations are some of the most fun nations. Let's take a quick look. Um, uh, but uh, my viewers don't seem to like them very much in general, uh, and so uh, that's why I don't play them. But there's two two that come to mind. The first is Perm, which I actually make a video on. is one of the videos I spent the most amount of time working on, and then it's super flopped, uh, which is kind of one of the reasons I haven't done a Nation Spotlight video since, because uh, I did one Nation Spotlight video. I was trying to be jokey and meme and then it didn't get any views. But uh, Perm, I actually think, is a really interesting country. Um, uh which uh, has an enormous amount of resources. It's super resource rich, it's unrecognized, and you get perm in your all, which are two of the be best states in the game, but then you don't really have a lot of pops. It's not gonna, if we let the game think, it's probably gonna update the pops. Uh, at this point in the game, later on, we have five million pops, really not a lot of pops, um, but you have uh, just absolute banger resources to play with. And so um, I think that this one is interesting. The second one that I kind of like uh, is Manchuria, which is releasable for Qing. Uh, and so both of these give like a really nice feeling of having a really resource rich uh, while not uh, being OP or this type of thing. Uh, we could release China from the Heavenly Kingdom. You don't say, but let's release Manchuria uh, and release here. And uh, I think that Manchuria is also really fun to play. Again, very resource dids, uh, has really good mappy. Outer Manchuria will have gold mines appear. And so I think that this is an interesting one to play. Also. Han is not a primary culture for Manchuria. Uh, it is Manchu, uh, which means you are going to have to do something if you want to accept the Han pops. But I think that there's a lot of interesting releasables. Um, these are the two that come to mind, Perm and Manchuria. Uh, I would play way more releasables if um, people um, seem to like them. Um, but they every time I put it in polls, um, they always perform really poorly. And so um, like if I if I actually just had to straight up, I think choose uh, a country to play just for pure like pleasure alone and not doing any of the democracy bit, which to me in doing the democracy bit is important. It might be Manchuria. Um, I've been wanting to do a Manchuria run for a while. But no one's gonna no one's gonna vote for Manchuria. So we're never doing a Manchuria run ever. <laughs> Uh, so that's kind of the, the, that's the one. Okay, uh, let's jump back into the browser. Do you have plans to do roleplay runs or multiplayer games with other content creators? I'm generally open to doing more roleplay runs, especially if they pull well. I, I'll do a pull. Um, I, we, I haven't started the, uh, the Papal States run. Maybe we'll do a roll, uh, 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 question on whether or not it's, we do it RP style. Um, initially I kind of shied away from RP runs a lot because I felt that my niche was, uh, doing, uh, meta level play and actually shutting this type of thing, but people have generally been positive on it. And so maybe we do a poll and multiplayer games with other content creators. Um, 
I'm, I'm, well, okay, so on one hand, I'm very open to doing this sort of thing. On the other hand, um, I can be somewhat abrasive, I think, um, or people can rub me the wrong way relatively easily, uh, which isn't to say I'm not willing, but like, um, if I, if I rub someone the wrong way or they rub me the wrong way, that might be a reason why this goes, why this fails more so than me being like unwilling from a content creation sort of perspective. Um, and I'm not trying to sound, make myself sound spooky if anyone's interested, but I, I, I'm generally willing, but, um, I, yeah, okay. Uh, do you fear PDX pulling out future support with uh, updated plans for Victoria 3 like they did Imperator? No. Uh, there's uh, there's this, like, uh, what is it? It's not a saying. Um, there's this, like, story that might be, that's, n I forget who it applies to. It's a real story, if I recall correctly, but it could just be a fictional one regarding business, uh, where some business executive hires someone uh, in a position to do a particular thing, and the guy makes a mistake and it costs the company millions of dollars. And then uh, the guy goes between his legs to the executive, the CEO, and he's like, I'm sorry, I messed this up. Please don't fire me. And the CEO's almost like, fire you? Why would I fire you? I just spent millions of dollars training you, right? The idea is, is that uh, I think if you were going to look at a company and you were going to try and find a company that is going to be very unlikely to have a, an Imperator 2 or an Imperator fail, Paradox would be one of them because man, do they feel the heat from their error with Imperator. And so they are probably going to be even more likely to avoid this type of error uh, than a regular company. Also secondarily, um, I don't know if this is the case, but it seems like uh, the development team for Victoria 3 might be smaller. And so they might just be committing less resources so that even if Victoria 3 underperforms, um, they can afford to kind of continue uh, support for it. Or they might have a different system that allows it to them to throw the support for Victoria 3 based on how popular it is or this type of thing um, because they can't light money on fire as a company they're also a publicly company traded company um, which they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders um, like there was this uh, famous court case against Ford like uh, I think in the early it might have been in the 18 1900s it was a while ago uh, where Ford wanted to pay their workers more money and they were sued by the shareholders uh, who argued that they had a fiduciary responsibility to maximize profit and the shareholders won. Um, and so I, I don't think uh, they can light money on fire because they want uh, Victoria 3 to be the best thing ever. And if they, if Victoria 3 is not doing well in terms of numbers and like buying, then that means they can't commit as much resources to it. Um, but I think that they, they probably have some sort of system for throttling resources rather than full on abandonment as was the case with Imperator would be my guess. What about the Victoria 3 system surprised you the most? Um, I don't know if anything surprised me, but it was like novel and fun to discover a lot of stuff. Um, surprise might not be the right word. I really like how prices change dynamically. I suppose to some extent, if we jump back in here, uh, I thought it was really interesting somewhat recently how the equilibrium price, uh, you can you can decide you wanna care about just construction, right? Which is the, these cells here. Or you can decide you want to care about just workers, which is these cells, and depending on which one you are caring about, and by the way, you could care about a mix, which is a whole different type of equation, you will get different prices or equilibriums for a softwood, for example, 20, plus 25% versus minus 33%, which is pretty interesting, um, I think. Uh, but it surprise might not be the best one. Uh, would you say that your approach to Victoria 3 has changed a lot since you started playing it? I don't changed a lot. I mean, I certainly am at war all the time and trying to make use of my infamy and seeing my infamy as a resource. I suppose that changed from my very initial. I think that the way, the amount of weight I have put on capitalist ownership has changed, but also mechanically in game, a result of Mappy is significantly nerfed the importance of it. Um, but uh, being a little bit more GDP oriented instead of capitalist ownership oriented, I'd say that that's happened to some extent. Um, you know, uh, so I mean, I mean, it's it's developed over time a tremendous amount. Like if I watch some of my older tutorials or some of my older gameplay, I think I I play significantly worse. Um, also, but also Victoria Three is changing simultaneously with that. Uh, like for example, you don't play, you don't chase throughput anywhere near as much as you did in one point four. Chasing throughput was really good. You can't do it now because of Mappy, but that's a result of the game actually being different. Um, and what is your biggest change in perspective? Uh, might be capitalist ownership. I don't know. That one's a, a little bit hard to do. 
What's the most insane bug you've encountered in your time that you've never been able to work out? That's an interesting one. Um, I don't know if work out is like uh, the proper th way of framing it, but the most insane experience I've ever had is it has to be like uh, some like of the times that someone who just has no business uh, being swayed against me uh, gets swayed against me and I'm just like, I have no idea what's up with this, but that's not actually a bug. Um, most insane bug. Oh, you know what one might be is um, when you're playing, when you're forming the HRE, I don't know if this bug's still in, uh, you can get still get the Italian Riga Mizzotro event because Italian becomes a primary culture and you can have Tuscany annex your entire country as a result. And then you play as Tuscany and your ta your tag just changes and you get Tuscany's tech and this sort of thing. Um, and so that might be the most insane one. I don't know if it's fixed at this point. I assume it is, but it might not be. Has playing Vic 3 in uh, influenced the way you see the world today? I don't think it has a tremendous amount. Um, probably not. For me, I can't help but read news shows about a factory being built on or an immigration policy and think, nice to see the investment pool in action, or hopefully this means new workers to fill the factories. I would say no. Um, I don't uh, I don't think I process it in this way. I think that the way I see the world more influences like how I talk and think it through Victoria 3 than the other way around. Um, or if this is happening, I cannot at this current juncture, this is probably happening more than I think it is uh, as I'm reading this, uh, but I cannot at this current juncture come up with an example. Did we play Vic 2? No. Uh, which kind of answers the second part of that question. When can we expect the cooking tutorial? The cooking tutorial is about the meme, more so than the actual tutorial. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, but I have been thinking through, okay, so I guess it won't be a surprise if I talk about it, but I'm gonna talk about it. Uh, for 10,000 subscribers special, which we're behind on, I have been thinking about making a pie, and I've been trying to think about the most absurd way to make a pie, and so far my thoughts are, is I could make a pie and uh, you know talk about in the video or short how I need a pie, so unfortunately I'm gonna have to make it, and then when making the pie, use an entire pie uh, with which to make the crust. So put the pie, an entire pie in a food processor, grind it up, and then turn it into a pie crust. Uh, and all the while complain about how it's so hard to get pie. Um, this is kind of my thought. And of course that ruins the surprise, but ow, the truth hurts. Please make another military guide suit. The military guide is not necessarily my hugest focus. Uh, here, we'll like this. Also upload on Patreon, bro. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to upload because I just do currently polls on Patreon, but I do have a Patreon. Shout out to me. Uh, links should be in the description below. I'm not saying it is in the description below, but it should be. Um, do you secretly play any other games that you never talk on stream or make videos about? Yes. I will often, uh, I will stream these games um, sometimes, uh, but if I feel that I'm not very good at a game, I feel uh, maybe insecure is the best word about playing it uh, on stream. Uh, and also uh, some games that I think that there's just no interest for, um, I don't stream or make videos about. Um, and if there was more interest, I might do that. Um, so an example is I could make Magic the Gathering content, because um, I was fairly deep in those streets, the ultimate citrus experience. Um, and I think that my Magic the Gathering content wouldn't be terrible, uh, but I don't touch this at all. Um, I've also, uh, like I think my first video uploaded was a poker video. I don't really play poker anymore, um, but uh, could do that. I've, I've been trying to branch out a little bit in terms of streams. Um, nothing really feels like it's connecting. Not that I really expect anything to connect. I think that people are here for the Victoria 3 more so than, um, like variety streamers, they're there for the personality. I am not a variety streamer, I'm not close, and I, I think it's unreasonable for me to expect to have anywhere near the viewership I do uh, when I play anything off Victoria 3. Um, and I also don't want to inundate people who have subscribed to me wanting to only see Victoria 3 content with content from another game unless it's, uh, unless my play or my knowledge base is particularly high quality because that's not what they really signed up for as much, but at the same time... It's, uh, man, the title of this, the title of this channel is Generalist Gaming, and we're not doing a lot of generalizing at this point. Uh, maybe outside the scope, it is, uh, but why generalist? It's never outside the scope for a generalist, and what is the significance of your profile Could, picture? What is the persona you've chosen to represent yourself online? So, the pro profile picture is AI generated, 
uh, and I gave it the input, I forget what all the inputs are, but the ver two very significant ones was it was supposed to be a merging of Leonardo da Vinci and Hannibal Barca, both of whom I uh, uh, idolize, I suppose, or hold as role models. Um, Leonardo da Vinci being the ultimate generalist, uh, and so um, this is what I got used to get the picture, but I had him in Greek marble statue wearing like headphones or something like this. And then I like the color scheme too. Um, I really, really like Hannibal Barca. I've done a video on my other channel about why I like Hannibal Barca. And I really like Leonardo da Vinci. Um, also, when I was a bouncer at a nightclub, we had to have code names. That way people couldn't identify us and like, I don't know, come to our house. Uh, and so my code name when I was a uh, bouncer was Leo short for Leonardo da Vinci, but everyone thought I was a Leo, or that, yeah, everyone thought I was a Leo, but, <laughs> uh, in terms of astrology, but no, it was for Leonardo da Vinci, um, so that's, uh, that's the profile picture and the persona, and, but why generalist is, uh, again, I think I've discussed this a little bit, uh, but I do identify as a generalist, generally speaking, um, <laughs> the truth hurts uh but uh you know i have i have two other channels and initially my two channels was the strength channel and the ideas channel these were my first two channels um and uh to some extent uh if i had to choose a channel that's the most important to me it would actually be the ideas channel uh and i don't upload it on that much i'm not that focused on it but i think that ideas are the more important thing the gaming channel is the one that got traction and so that's what you guys see today um but i think that it's important to, here, let's find a quote. Let's find a quote. Okay, so this isn't exactly a philosopher I necessarily admire or read or anything, but Thucydides, Thucydides uh, has a quote. Uh, the nation that makes itself a great distinction between its scholars and its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. Uh, for me, it is actually important. Uh, I Self-improvement and self-development has been uh, an underlying theme uh, throughout my entire life. And to some extent, this is probably, um, you know, motivated in part by uh, insecurity. But I have always, it's always been important to me to try and develop myself intellectually and physically. And so, um, you know, this is why we have the Ideas channel. And this Ideas channel is mainly book reviews. And I've, like, read tons and tons of books. And then also why we have the Strength channel, which is me lifting. I think I will show you, or I'm planning on showing, because um, I knew this question was coming, um, a couple of my lifts. But I'm actually also incredibly strong. I'm just making sure that that's muted beforehand. But this is me bent pressing uh, 200 pounds. And a bent press is a lift that you get above your head in one arm. Uh, it has text to speech on the video, but I can't show it because it also has music. Uh, but that's 200 pounds. That's a 45 on each side, a 25 on each side, a 5 on each side, and 2.5 on each side. And that's over my head. And that's one arm, obviously. Um, the goofy one arm lifts, uh, and the, to be some extent, uh, the goofy one arm lifts are part of why uh, you know, part of why I am, uh, how should I say, uh, generalizing even when in, as it relates to being strength oriented, because for me, um, a lot of people, the, what, the, what are the common sort of, um, strength, uh, tests of strength, which is powerlifting and weightlifting are incomplete. They are not fully generalized and it's not general strength because, uh, you have to interact with the world in asymmetric ways. And so this one arm stuff and this twisting stuff and all this turning stuff, I add it to what I think is important as a strength athlete. Um, and this is probably my most, uh, for most people, my most significant or impressive lift. Um, and so, okay. Um, another one, which I think would also generally people find impressive, uh, would be this is a one arm snatch. So that's 225s on each side. It's a total of 165 pounds. And also I can't spell here. But yeah, so that's from the ground overhead with one arm, uh, except I can't spell arm. But it is it being generally strong uh, is something that is important to me and has been important to me. And to be fair, uh, the past couple of months, I actually haven't worked out that much. And I think that's part of the reason why I haven't been feeling so good overall in a general sense. Um, but uh, I, I should I I need to get back into it. But for me, this is like you you should try and be a complete individual. This involves, you know, both, uh, as Thucydides would say, the nation that makes a great distinction between scholars and warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. I think if you're trying to live like correctly in the same way, I guess you try and play a game correctly, this error-proof title way, you 
to try and develop yourself both intellectually and also physically. And so that's what this is about. Uh, and also, obviously, this means you have to do multiple, uh, multiple things at once. There's a book called Range also, uh, for those of you who are interested in generalizing as a pursuit for the specific uh, you know, context of developing um, skills, uh, which is a bit of an interesting one, which shows how you, know, you can have knowledge or expertise in one sphere and that sphere can be highly relevant uh, to another, or it can be useful um, for another one. Um, and uh, in it, he also makes this distinction between wicked and kind learning environments. Um, but that's a bit much to unpack. But the idea is that sometimes the best way to get really good at something is actually just to learn something else or to not just like brute force uh, spend tons and tons of hours in that thing. And to be fair, um, you know, part of, oh, we can come up, now we have an example here. Part of why I decided it was useful to come up with price equilibriums for the market depending on what was valued is because of my experience playing poker. Because poker, you try and play what's called GTO, Game Theory Optimal. There's an optimum uh, type of uh, behavior you should engage in. And so this idea that we could hit an indifference threshold when talking about the prices of goods, the idea that you could do this is kind of coming from poker because, you know, we... Uh, in poker, you are often trying to hit an indifference threshold. Now, in Victoria 3, what it means is, at this price, you do not care which building you build. Um, but in poker, it's at this, like, uh, you know, frequency, you don't care whether they call or fold. Uh, which is that you are supposed to actually balance a range, and when you have uh, a bunch of really strong value hands, you should add in, depending on the size of your bet, a proportionate amount of um, bluffs and so that you are indifferent to whether your opponent calls or folds. Uh, because when they call, um, you win extra money uh, from your value hands, but you lose the bluffing money from the bluff hands. And when they fold, you lose out on extra value from the value hands, but you win the pot uh, with the bluffing hand. And so your EV is the value of the pot every single time you bet if you bet with a balanced range. And that sounds like a bunch of words, but I don't want to unpack it too, too much. Um, because we are not trying to unpack uh, indifference thresholds in poker theory right now. That's just trying to talk about an example. Um, but yeah, uh, that's kind of the significance of these things. Vic 2 or Vic 3? I have like 60 hours of Vic 2 and I couldn't understand it and I didn't play it. Favorite game? Uh, this one's a little bit tough. I suppose the easy, like the layup answer is um, uh, Europa Uranus Falls 4. Um, I, but... The So in a sense, some of the games I got the most enjoyment of in my lifetime uh, might have been, uh, you know, games of my childhood, which I don't think are objectively good, right? But maybe Dynasty Warriors 3 through 5 I got, like, more enjoyment out of than any other game. And then games that I think are best in the vacuum. Like, I'm a fairly strong chess player. I think chess is an incredible game in a vacuum because it's incredibly simple and has a ton of depth. This is the hallmark of a really, really good strategy game that you can learn the rules in 10 minutes and then you can spend 50,000 hours trying to get better and still not be, uh, you know, unbeatable or this type of thing. Or there will still be like a huge difference between you and the next best player. Um, you know, because it's about 10,000 hours to become a master. If you have 20,000 hours and you try and square up against Magnus Carlsen, the, well, wh who is effectively the world chess champion, um, you know, you're just going to get absolutely trucked. And, you know, with a game like Victoria 3, um, I think that if someone with 20,000 hours played, which I don't think, well, that's actually not possible because there's only like just under 9,000 hours in a year and the games are out for 15 months. So someone with 10,000 hours is borderline impossible. They would have to basically not sleep. Um, but if you took uh, someone who with, I think like 2,000 Victoria three hours and 4,000 Victoria three hours, I don't think there would be a huge difference. With chess, there would be a huge difference, um, you know, in terms of uh, your, your performance. Uh, and so I think that uh, games that are like an objective sense sort of good, for strategy games have this feature uh, that they have an enormous amount of uh, depth in that sense. However, most bad strategy games just add complexity 
um, without really adding the depth uh, necessarily, or they add a bunch of like complexity that just effectively adds button clicks. And so when you see a strategy game that, um, uh, so well, with chess, you, it's a very simple game. Uh, and it, you can spend 10,000 hours getting better at it. With a bad game, it's a game that in order to understand anything of it, you need to spend an enormous amount of time. And then once you understand it at all or how to play, deciding the best strategy is really easy. Uh, and so that's an example of a game that's bad because learning the rules is not um, a fun part of the game, uh, generally speaking, when playing a game. And instead, you know, having this sort of depth that you get with chess. Um, I think chess and poker are really, really cool games uh, because there is an enormous amount of depth. And while there is simultaneously very, very simplicity, like in poker, you can bet, you can check, and you can fold. You have three actions you can do. Now, to be fair, your bet size can be anything you want it to be and no limit, but uh, it's incredibly simple. Uh, but the, at the same time, people have these complex computer algorithms called solvers uh, looking to find the best strategy and people can uh, create very complex strategies for poker despite it being an incredibly simple game. And so I think that that's a hallmark of a good game. What we get with something like Victoria 3 is this historical map game overlay element which is going to be really hard to add, have the same type of simplicity and depth that we're talking about with chess and poker. I think uh, Victoria 3 is not as simple as either of those games, uh, and it also doesn't have as much depth. I think that a person with 1,000 Victoria 3 hours is going to be much closer to a person with 10,000 than a person with 1,000 chess hours to 10,000 in terms of skill, uh, because there's, there's more to learn. Um, but we have this, uh, you know, grand strategy map game type thing, which is good fun in its own right. Uh, and so when evaluating games, it's also difficult because it would be unfair to compare Victoria 3 uh, to chess uh, if the criteria is like simplicity and depth, right? Uh, it's chess is something fundamentally else. And so um, also you get to play like a real world narrative in your head, which you don't get to do with chess. There's also, I think, a phenomenon that is fun about these types of games, which is... Um, Kind of hard to... So there's this Nietzsche quote. I forget the exact language of the quote. We're not going to pull it up. But something to the effect of, joy is the feeling of your power increasing. And one of the reasons I think that these games are fun are not because they're like a true expression of skill, but you get to watch the line go up. Uh, we have no historical data because we swapped countries. This is tragic. Uh, but the line goes up. And I think that, um, you know, watching yourself slowly gain power is one of the fun elements or one of the reasons why these games are psychologically rewarding. Uh, and you don't get that with, like, chess or poker. Well, poker, you do get the line going up, but the line the line also goes down a lot with poker. Poker's really high variance. It's psychologically a very rough game. Um, but with this, um, you're, you want the line to go up. You feel like the line's going up. It gives you pleasure. Um, and so joy is the feeling of your power increasing. Uh, and so uh, I, I think that this just phenomenon or nature of just slowly feeling more and more powerful is one that's like psychologically rewarding in these types of games, which is why I think these types of games are attractive. Um, but favorite game of all time, I mean, I've played a ton of League of Legends as well. Um, in terms of my most hours played, it's probably uh, chess and then League of Legends and then Europa Universalis 4. Um, but favorite is really going to be mood dependent. Actually, Magic the Gathering is high up there too. Uh, but that's kind of uh, a little bit more my wheelhouse in terms of uh, what I've done. Um, also, I'm in terms of if anyone's going to request league content, I'm super washed. And so um, that would be entirely the reason why you've never seen me play League of Legends. Uh, although I, I, like, I occasionally play, but I've never played it on um, stream or video. What major did you choose in, uh, and why did you choose that path? We've kind of I'll already answered this one, but I chose philosophy mainly because I was trying to figure life out at that point in time. And also just understanding the nature of the world and reality and this type of stuff, it seemed like the best major. Uh, to be fair, that major gets a bad rap. People think it's wishy-washy. It's effectively a major in critical thinking more than anything else. Um, the, the substance of it uh, is not as important as your ability to evaluate arguments that are really abstract and complex. Um, and also, uh, a lot of them end up being kind of language games, 
uh, in the sense, I maybe shouldn't even say language games because it invokes a particular ph philosopher, Wittgenstein. But a lot of times, uh, what two arguments are are just two people passing, talking past each other, with two different understandings of either reality or the language that people use in order to refer to things. Uh, and so understanding and being able to parse through this is definitely a skill you acquire in philosophy, and I think it's a skill that a lot of people uh, don't have. Um, and they aren't uh, that good at uh, also generously interpreting what other people are trying to say in order to actually evaluate their argument instead of, um, a lot of people just want to appear smart. Um, and when you want to appear smart, uh, you say stuff very confidently, very authorit uh, authoritatively, um, and this will generally make you appear smart uh, more so than like, um, you know, being more apprehensive. Um, and so um, appearing smart is a different skill than actually being smart. I think actually being smart, and by actually being smart, I mean formulating a worldview of reality that is the most robust possible. What this means is you will actually have to be wrong a lot, um, because in order to if in order to create a model of reality, uh, or so, let's back up. Um, if you if you never change your opinion, that means your model of reality will be the first one that has ever been presented to you, or the first one you realized, or the first one you thought of. The odds that you get the answer right the very first time around are so incredibly low. And so this means if you want to actually have a robust understanding of reality, you are going to have to update that uh, kind of thing of reality a lot. Uh, in social contexts, people don't like to ever appear wrong, but social contexts are definitely a great place to learn, uh, but they are more concerned with um, appearing right than they are updating their notion of reality or testing their notion of reality or this type of thing. Um, and so I, I think that philosophy, kind of to bring it back to the question, I think that philosophy uh, helps to give you the skills for constructing a robust worldview. And I think to be fair, I would not be able to play without the types of tools that I got from a philosophy degree. I don't think I would be able to learn and discover different ways of looking at Victoria three uh, as well. And so uh, if you didn't choose secondary education, we did, or you answered the last question, what's your job? Right now it's trying to do this. Um, and to some degree, um, I if this, I have to, I kind of have a timeline in mind and a monthly amount I have to be getting. And if this is not successful, um, what I'm going to have to do is I'm probably going to um, try to become a personal trainer instead, uh, because this is definitely within the wheelhouse of uh, uh, something I am good at. Um, and also is something that's rewarding. But in general, um, I have for a long time wanted to, uh, so I think that um, as we enter, kind of this age of automation, the type of job you want to have is one uh, that is scalable and also is resilient to automation. And I think the nature of our economy is gonna change quite a lot in kind of a, a short period of time. And I don't wanna have too big a di digression on this, but uh, in terms of path, for a long time, I wanted to do something that's scalable. YouTube is scalable. An unlimited number of people can watch this video, right? Um, T, uh, the fallback, which is not as preferable, um, is like being a personal trainer, which you can only train person one on one. To be fair, I can make videos on that too while I'm doing it. But uh, if you're training someone one on one, you are. It's not a scalable endeavor, uh, right? It is. Uh, it's. You, it's singular and you want whatever you do to be scalable. This could also be manufacturing or inventing a product or this type of thing. But I think that with automation coming, um, you know, being able to communicate information is a really useful skill. You have to try and figure out what is, uh, what is scalable because this is everything that's not scalable is going to be uh, severely um, pressured by the increase in number of people looking for jobs as a result of automation. And so um, I've been leery about trying to do anything that's not scalable. And unfortunately, those are the jobs that are easier to access as well. And so um, we're trying to make videos on YouTube. So that's the job. What is your job? Um, and so that's this right now. Which is, a, it's definitely a little bit spooky. There's a ton of uncertainty. Also the nature, I'm not gonna, mm, I could show you guys my line go up chart in terms of um, views and revenue and this type of thing. But I would say that um, psychologically, uh, the nature of what I am doing uh, in terms of how my performance looks for, um, you know, the gaming channel, this is a little bit rough because what I end up having is I'm always trending down 
except when a new patch comes. And so here, let's uh, let's f come from the correct side for you guys to have. So if generally the trajectory that would be nice is the line's always going up. You're always having the joy of your power increasing. My line for like how my YouTube does is not like that at all. My line is everything's slowly decreasing all the time, pretty independent of what I do. And then when a patch hits, it spikes up to a new high and then it's down from there. And so what I have psychologically speaking, uh, this is such a tangent, uh, what I have psychologically speaking, my experience is, is that my channel is always doing worse than it was yesterday, uh, except for the week when something new comes out and then it's doing way, way, way better, like uh, in another like stratosphere. So like, um, I would much rather inverse the nature of that. I w even if the overall trajectory was line go up, which is the overall trajectory, I would much rather the line be steadily going up uh, most of the time and then catastrophically dip occasionally. But instead it's mostly going down and then catastrophically, I suppose, but the inverse of catastrophically, uh, it increases really high. And so, um, but yeah, this is what we're trying to do. Um, trying to make it on the YouTubes. Um, and so, um, to some extent, the, the uncertainty and if this works or not is a little bit stressful, uh, but that's uh, what I'm trying to do right now. But I think um, also, like, when I hit 10,000 subs, um, I thought I was going to be a lot happier than I was. Um, and I was happy, but I thought that I was going to feel a lot more fulfilled on it. And I think that uh, one problem, and this is something I've been reflecting on as the new year came, one problem is I've lost touch with my roots to some extent. I'm not uploading very consistently on my other channels. And I think that uh, for, in large part, this idea of generalizing and improving myself both intellectually and physically, um, I think that I've gotten too far away from this while focusing too much on the gaming channel, on the Victoria 3s. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, as a matter of uh, feeling fulfilled, I need to try and focus on all three at once, which is more difficult, um, I think, uh, than focusing on I, any one of them singularly. Um, but I, the, the, the task isn't doing the, the easiest thing necessarily. It's, it's trying to do the full thing. But um, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, uh, in terms of previous uh, like employment or other things that I've pursued um, as it relates to this question, um, going to grad school is like the, uh, and teaching philosophy is another thing that is like on the table for me. Um, COVID kind of hit when I was applying to grad school. And so that's, um, yeah. Uh, and so then that kind of put it, uh, a damper on things. Also, I've become somewhat disillusioned with academic philosophy in general. So that seems like less of a thing. And then also teaching uh, or being a personal trainer is, I guess, I fall back. Um, uh, and before this, I was teaching chess to kids uh, at after school programs. And I was like kind of during and following um, finishing my major in philosophy. And that's kind of like where I'm at now. Anyways, uh, that is all of the questions here. Uh, and so I will bid you guys adieu uh, and farewell. I hope you enjoyed this fun getting to know you session with, with me. <laughs> and uh, if you liked it, you know, feel free to do the YouTube algorithm stuff. It does help out. Um, also, it's like, it's strange to put at the end of every video, you know, something I also sometimes put at the end of the videos is if you don't like my content, two things. If you hated this video and it made you seethe with an unfathomable rage, two things. Uh, so when you see a video and you see this triple dot, you can click on this triple dot, yeah? Uh, and I don't think this one will give me the same options, but what you can do is you can click on the triple dot and you can say, don't show me any videos from this guy. And I highly recommend you do this uh, to content creators you don't enjoy because it allows you to kind of curate your own thing. Um, but also, second of all, if you've watched this to the end uh, and it is an hour and a half and you've hated every minute of it, um, you need better time management. Um, there's, I mean, there's just like, there's got to be a better way for you to filter out what you're watching. You know what I mean? Um, and if this makes you seize with even more rage, good. Um, because um, being active with kind of what you're consuming is uh, going to significantly improve the quality of what it is you're consuming. Also, if you've just like been having this on in the background and you're like, um, you don't think it does anything for you and this type of thing, like um, maybe make a playlist or something of things that you think you're going to enjoy more. I don't, I don't know exactly what the strategy is, but the, the point is, is if, if you get this far and you don't like what you're watching, I, I, some error, some significant error has been made.
Um, yeah. Uh, I think I already said the YouTube algo stuff, so with that, I will bid you farewell. Au revoir. Goodbye.